Yeah, all of us. We are media people, and all of us, I think, is there anybody don't have a mobile phone in your purse or in your lap or something today? I think we, we not many of us. So our culture has brought us to uh, conclude that if any communication uh, is not entertaining, captivating, or exciting, then it's not really worth spending time of it. And this is not true, because a lot of what we watch, a lot of what entertain us uh, every week, is actually irrelevant, if you think about that. Think of the uh, Football uh, World Cup, for instance. Wow, goal! Yeah, so if you were sleeping, now you're awake. <laughs> and then, uh, so, but after the match, Monday morning, you're going to work. It's completely irrelevant. Whether your team win or lose or whatever happened, it's irrelevant. And a lot of our entertainment is like that. How many of you uh, watched the, the, the movie Titanic years, years ago? Okay. <gasps> wow, that was like such a masterpiece of movie. So irrelevant. So what? So it didn't change. Did it make you be more happy in your marriage? Did it help you find a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Have you found love because of it? Has it changed your life? Not at all. But in fact, the most life-changing uh, events or the things that would have happened to you in your life most of the time is not really entertaining. Is that true? So look at the book of Leviticus. It doesn't have to be entertaining to be important or life-changing or something. So open my eyes this morning, O oh Lord, that I may see wonderful things in your law. Amen? Is that your prayer? Can you pray that with me this morning? Can you say it with me? Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. One question for you as we go on. Can we find love in such a book, a bloody book with rituals, rules, and regulations? Can we find love in Leviticus? Is there love in a book like Leviticus? Actually, yes, there is. There is. If you only look at the intention of God. You see, a lot of our uh, communication is, is, is uh, without words. My eyes can communicate, you see? Sometimes I look at my wife, I don't have to speak any words, I just look and <laughs> she, knows what, she knows what I'm uh, expressing. So, so th there are things like this that we, without words, or, or without, without the words I love you, can be communicate I love you. Certain actions, certain uh, expressions, uh, will will express I love you without saying I love you. So I think in the book of Leviticus we will find that many things that where God does not necessarily say I love you my people, but he will express I love you my people and we can recognize that. In the verse, uh, slide number two, we read Leviticus chapter 26. There's a mistake here, somebody pointed out to me between the services, it's Leviticus 26. Um, God says, begins, if you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands. Well, that's not a very good, uh, uh, oh, oh, that's not what I'm reading, isn't it? That's a wrong quote. Okay, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, let me read it. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands. That's nothing very, very much fun about obeying the commands and everything. Yeah, click, the, click the next one then. I think we will, okay, this one is right, this one is not right, but from here it is. So God says, if you follow my decrees and careful to be my commands, something will happen to you. Like your life will be impacted by your obedience, by, by giving attention to what God wants for you. Because you will understand the intention of God. Look at this text here. Is God's intention good? Yes, yes it is so wonderful. He wants to bless you with the rain, with the crops that you will eat, that you will have peace. He wants you to sleep at night. He wants not to you to be worried about and anxious about anything. I will look favorably upon you. I will make you fertile. I will multiply your people. I will fulfill my covenant. It's all positive. That is your God. This is my God. This is how God is. So can we find love in the book of Leviticus? Yes, we look at the intention of God. But it gets better than that. When you go to verse 11, 
And if you click at the next slide, you will see that God says, I will live among you. And now you find the ultimate goal of God. So the, the text before give us to understand his intention, but this one give us the ultimate goal of God. Leviticus points us to the heart of a father that longs to dwell among his people. If you look at these pictures, this is what God is showing us in the wonderful, this is the most wonderful picture in the Old Testament of the love of God, of God's desire to dwell in the midst of the multitude of his people. But you can see here, the, the clear that the, the, the separation, he is a holy God. He wants to be in the midst, but there is certain way to approach him through the sacrifice, through sanctifications, uh, and, and, and the priesthood that are there between God and man to, to bring us to God. But the intention of God is so clear. God wants to dwell among his people. He wants you, he wants Israelites to be his people, to, to experience his presence, to experience his favor. Is blessing. That is what God wants to do. I will live among you. This is the foundation of the story of redemption. We had sin in Genesis. You have sin. We became slave. And Exodus, he set us free. He brings us into a land. He will lead us into his presence. And Leviticus, we stop. And God is going to instruct us, give us the foundation to understand him, how to live, to, to experience his, his blessing. You know, for those of you who are married this morning in this room, the room here, your children don't love your rules. They don't love your rules. They don't appreciate it. Go to bed. Eat your cereals or your vegetables. Maybe cereals, they like it. You eat, eat your broccoli. No, I don't like broccoli or something. Uh, you know, don't, don't, don't touch the remote control or, you know, something like this. So children don't like the parents' rules. But the parents have lived longer, have more experience, have more information, and for the welfare of their children, for their protection, they will instruct them for the, for the welfare, for their health. Uh, I remember meeting a couple, and the husband was very angry with his wife because the, the, the wife was traveling a lot, and uh, when she would come home, she would spoil the child. Uh, so the child could, uh, you know, uh, sleep any time at night. And the husband was very angry with his wife. Actually, I, I, they ended up in, with marital counseling and getting separated later. But anyway, because the next morning, he was the one taking the child to school. And he was the one to wake her up in tears and screaming that she didn't want to, to wake up and get up of bed. He was the one that had to drag her to take the bus. So one day he told his, his wife, life is better when you are not there. Okay, so, so that tells us that about, about rules and regulation. You can spoil, you can leave a child free, but you mess up the life of that child. What kind of schooling, and she will be sleeping instead of learning, and she will be tired, and, and the rules is go to bed early so that you wake up early so that you can concentrate on the next day. So rules are important, and our Heavenly Father established rules and boundaries for us because He is a good Father. Because he knows what is coming ahead of us. He's the eternal God. And he has a, a pathway. We have read that he, I will live among you. I will not despise you. I will walk among you. I will be your God. I will be my people. Uh, this is what I want. And the, 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 the highlight of that, you find it, this message, you find it throughout the Old Testament. This is the foundation. But then it will be repeated by the prophets. Then you will come to the New Testament. It will be repeated. Then you come to the very last book, almost the last scene before eternity begins. And you find in Revelation chapter 21, verse 3, a loud voice from the throne that says, See, the tent of God is among humans. He will make his home with them. They will be his people. God himself will be with them, and he will be their God. This is the desire of our loving God. And God will do everything necessary to bring us there. God is paying the price, okay? If you 
think about the context of Leviticus, you will see the sacrifices of Leviticus, the bloody sacrifice, the animal sacrifice, point to the mercy of God. He's removing our guilt. He's dealing with our sinfulness. He is making us uh, accepted to come near to him. The laws of the Leviticus establish a protection. It establishes how we can be prosper, how we can have a welfare. The tabernacle points to two things. It points to the presence of God right now in our midst, and it points to the future tabernacle, the heavenly tabernacle, because this one is only a shadow. It's a passing message. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a symbol preparing us to understand that Jesus Christ is the great high priest, and there is a temple in heaven. We learned that in the book of Hebrews. So the, the tabernacle points us toward heaven. It tells us that Christ is in heaven. The priest of the Old Testament of Leviticus point us to Jesus Christ who stand at the right hand of the Father pleading and interceding for us. And you see all of that in the book of Leviticus. So that is a wonderful book when you think about that. It's not a book to be entertained. It's a book to learn, to dig, and to appreciate God. Learn His intention. Learn about His love manifested through these. Now this morning I want to talk to you about the practical side of holiness. If you go to the next slide, slide 4, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 2. Give the following instructions to the entire community of Israel. You must be holy because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. So we, we have looked at this text before. This is the strongest statement of God throughout this book. It is repeated countless times, many, many times. But look at the, 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 the part of it. Uh, can you remove the, the last part, Andreas? Just go back to the, the first part. Go up, up, go back, 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 back. I just want this, this verse over here. Why is it going like this? Use your mouse. Yes, thank you. Okay. Give the following instruction. You must be holy. That's a commandment. That is not an option. That's a commandment addressed to who? To you. To you. So that is God's intention, God's desire. God wants to see that happening into, into your life, into my life. And then you, you, you think, okay, holy, holy, what, what, what is that? Uh, how, how do I attain that? And then we have all sorts of concepts that we, we talked about it, but this morning we will see the practical side of holiness. This is a gem that we discover in this, in this chapter, chapter 19. I, the Lord, your God, am holy. If holiness is God's nature, and you and I are commanded to be holy, then we must understand what it means and, and how to, to be. The chapter concludes in saying that, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, which also already explains some of it. God is a God of deliverance. God is a savior. God is a liberator. He took us from slavery and he brought us here and he is teaching us how to live with him so that he will be living uh, with us always. So this is part of the nature of God to, to be like this. Now we are going to understand a little bit more what the practical side of, of uh, this holiness because you must be holy. It means you must reflect that holiness. You must live in a way that holiness is being expressed and you, God, they can see the holiness of God into your life. And this is a set of rules that God is going to give to, to, give to us this morning that tells us in God's eyes what it is to be holy. Uh, you can click now, Andreas, just one time. Yes, okay. Look at this list here. Because of God's holiness, that you should reserve food for the poor and the foreigners. 
That means when you, you, uh, you cultivate your field, you, the, the, the harvesters, if they drop something, they leave it there. You don't do all the corners, you don't clean your fields, you leave it for the poor people and for the foreigners. Not steal, not deceive, cheat our neighbor. Not to oppress or defraud or rob him. Not insult, make fun or curse the deaf or cause the blind to fall or stumble. Not to show partiality in legal matters, the favoring the poor or the rich or accepting bribes or, you know, uh, not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Not nurse hatred in your heart for your brother. Not seek revenge or bear a grudge. This is so, so practical. And the list continues a little bit here, verse 33, you will see uh, others. Do not mistreat foreigners. Treat them like the native people, like uh, fellow Israelites. Love them as you love yourself. Do not cheat anyone by using false measure. Use honest scales. I am the Lord your God, and I brought you out of, of Egypt. So that's the context. God says, I want you to be holy. And then he starts to give us these rules, these simple, practical, very practical. I want to go back to verse 16. That I have a little bit more of context here, and I will read it for you, 16 to 18. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly, do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for the sin. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelites, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I want to, to uh, stop a bit on, on this verse here because there is a connection here between slander and your neighbor's life being threatened. You know, because when you slander someone, you are endangering someone's life. Is that true? You are making that reputation of that person like something. People will either reject, maybe will lose his job if it is like in a job uh, uh, environment or something, or he will lose other friends or, or money or a business or trust of somebody's reputation in society. So when there is slanderous gossip, you cause the life of someone else to be endangered or to be messed up or to be destroyed or some, some sorts. So if it end up to be a court case or if it end up to be uh, the, uh, something that the, the life of that person will be so messed up, it says don't stand idly by when your neighbor's life is threatened. In other words, get up and go fix that. You messed it up, you go and fix it. You destroy the reputation of someone, you slander someone which is falsely accusing, then you don't stand idly when you will see that person you know, falling apart, when you will see that person being rejected, when you will see the, the reputation of that person. You caused it. So if you s don't spread slanderous gossip among your people and do not stand idly by when your neighbor's life is... is this is so, so practical. You need to get up and fix it, humble yourself, tell the truth, and fix the problem that you cause. That is what God says. And that is applicable at home, that's applicable at work, it's applicable in the, in the, church, in the church life, always. Isn't it very practical? Is that right? This is not for only pastors or holy people or missionaries or something. This is very down to earth uh, daily life. Who command this? Is that the church, the pastor, the theology? No, it's God. It says says, I want you to be holy. And this is, don't do that. By not doing that, by not practicing this lifestyle, you are being holy. You participate. You, you mirror my character. You reflect my character, my intention in the life of someone else. There is nothing spiritual in this list here. If you look at this list. So this morning, are you holy? I know nobody knows how to answer that question. Yeah, because if you look at this, you know, God says, this is for everybody. You are an ordinary person, living in a family, going to work, you have colleagues, you attend a church family, and in what you do, and in what you say, 
you reflect or you don't reflect the, other, the otherness of God, the distinctiveness of God. By what you say, by how you live, you reflect God, you belong to Him, you are like Him, or you are not uh, like Him. You don't have to be anybody special. Everyone is commanded to be like God. So loving Him and being like Him, it's very basic. I remember years ago in China, the conference, student conference, there was this young man from Indonesia. And uh, he was really, he had a really a past, pastor's heart. He lived in Guangzhou, and he was the leader of the Guangzhou Fellowship at the time, students. And when we would go to the, 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 the conference, you would see all of these new believers from Indonesia. They would be like, uh, like little chicks around the, the, the hand, just like flooding around. You could see that he was, he was the leader, and he really cared for them, and he really prayed for them. But he says, at that time, there was some sorts of um, doctrinal confusion in, in Indonesia and many of the churches and in his own church. And he says, one day he approached me and says, Pastor, I don't know what to do because all of these new believers, when they will return to Indonesia, I need to send them to a church. But many of the churches are so spiritually high there like really, it's Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, supernatural, miracles, demons, and uh, you know, angels, and all of this. But they, they are not going to hear the basic of Christianity. And these church, like, just love your neighbor. They are not going to, 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 to hear that. And he was really concerned. But if you look at the book of Leviticus, the, the spirituality that God is laying as a foundation for you and for me is basic, it's practical, it's attainable. You don't have to be so spiritual to be spiritual. You just have to go on living your life and living like God intend you to live by not doing certain uh, harmful, uh, hurtful, or uh, destructive behavior toward other people, just by not doing that. Okay, so that's what we are learning this morning. And if you look at many of these commands here, they all start by do not. So many of us will say do not. We don't like that. Do not, do not. The Bible is full of do not. But actually they are so positive. Do not kill, do not destroy, do not speak, do not follow, have a false this, do not you know, hurt other people. It's do not. So, which means instead, this is so positive. And it, it parallels the First Corinthians chapter 13 on, on the greatest uh, thing, love. First Corinthians chapter 13. We all know this chapter. We all love it. Talks about the, the highest level of love. But you will see that there is a lot of negative statement also in this beautiful text. Love is not jealous. Love is not boastful. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. That's all negative statement. But that builds up a beautiful picture of character. It's like you are removing the, the, the dirtiness, the evil, the wickedness. You are removing. Do not participate to, to wickedness. Remove. You are not rude. You are not proud. It does not demand its own way. Wow, put it in the, your, your marriage. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice. So in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, we see the parallel here. There's a lot of do not, but actually it's very positive do not. Yeah? You understand that? Yes? yes? All right. So there's a remedy here in this text about... Uh, uh, against nursing hatred. Do you know what nursing hatred is? How nursing hatred take place in the heart of someone? How destructive it can be, nursing hatred. And there's, there's a remedy to that here. So do not nurse, verse 17, hatred in your heart for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for the sin. What happened when you are frustrated by a certain event in your life. Think about marriage. On that wonderful day on the red carpet, 
You see, I love you. I promise to cherish you. I promise to honor you. And the good times and then the bad times. <laughs> but then the bad times is there now. And, and we get a frustration. We get, you know, something comes out of our mouth that we should not have said. We get hurt. Money is poorly spent. Uh, you know, th th a lot of conflicts, a lot of confusion in the house. And then gradually, there's a frustration. And here it says, confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for the sin. So confronting is important in that sense. But the truth is that for many people and many Christians, we do not know how. How and when, for what reason, what you should act the, uh, keep the balance between uh, things that is not important and not that you can let it pass by, certain things that you have to forgive and just go on with your life, but certain things needs to be handled. And if it is not handled, it will stay in the heart. You hurt me, and I should tell you something about it, like uh, brother or sisters, you know, what happened between us yesterday or something, it really hurt me, and, and I wish that we will fix it and make it right. If I cannot do that, it stays in my heart. Next time, when I will see you, there will be an uncomfortable uh, some, something, like a, 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 something is there that was not there before. So, okay, you can go on. But then, later on, it's still there, and then it will come to a point where just to see you will bother me. It, 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 I don't like to see you. It disturbs me. If I am with my group of friends and then you come with a group of friends, it disturbs or, or it disturbs my peace. Something has gone a bit deeper. Then someday you are walking here, I will walk there <laughs> so that I'm not going to meet you. I'm nursing something inside. Okay, it's there. Put it in marriage. What happened? I want a divorce. That's what is happening. Because it builds up and it builds up, it has never been fixed. So here God is so practical. He says in order to avoid, don't nurse hatred in your heart because it's going to have so many hurtful and harmful uh, consequences in your life. Confront when it's time. Fix it. Go to the person and fix that problem over here. This is so important. Confront here means reason with the person, plead with the person, argue for what is right, fix the problem. Conflict resolutions in marriage or in the, at workplace or something like this or in the church. If it's not fixed in the church, you may have church divisions or you will have members of the church that will disappear and you don't know why. They were here and then suddenly they are not there anymore. You don't know, you know people don't leave church because of God. They leave church because someone's hurt them, because someone spoke against them, because they have been offended by something, because they've been horrified by some negative behavior. And, it, and they didn't have the, the, the strength of character to maybe confront or go to, and the other person maybe was evil also. So they did not reflect. I was one time in a church back home in the divisions. The night that part of the church walked out of the room, I'm telling you, I did not see the character of God that night. I heard things, I saw behavior of older, supposedly spiritual and mature leader that was dishonorable, that should have never been done or practice of sin. I was a new believer, I saw that. And I did not understand because at the time I thought like, wow, the church is perfect. Have you ever found a, a perfect church? If you find it, don't walk in. Because <laughs> the day you will walk in, it will not be perfect anymore. So stay out. So you see, there's an example in the Bible. Remember Absalom? Absalom hated his brother, Ammon, because Ammon raped his sister because he was a step stepbrother. So it says here in the Bible, Absalom never said a word to Ammon, either good or bad. 
He hated Ammon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. So he hated him, but he never spoke a word good or bad. He never said it. He never settled that. And he killed him eventually. He nursed anger because he did not say good or bad. He just hid it and kept it in his heart. That shows how dangerous it is. So Andreas, if you would click the next. No, no, I mean, no, there was one more. Go back, sorry. This one here, there's a verse there. Yeah, okay. All right, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is what God is telling us here. Do not live like this if you want to be holy. Instead, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the message, the gem in that text here. Love your neighbor as yourself. Twice in this chapter, in verse 18 and 34, you find the most famous verse in Leviticus. The verse that is quoted by Paul repeatedly. In the New Testament, by First John, you will find it there. You will find it, and Jesus many times will quote that. And actually, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, go to the next slide. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said to him, next, you shall love your lo the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like, like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, look at that. Hang all the law and the prophets. You want to practice Christianity? You want to live like God? This is what God says. Same thing as in Leviticus. Leviticus in the New Testament have one message. And you know in this text when it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever had a class, a course, about how do you love yourself? How to learn to love yourself? Nobody learned that. Because this is ingrained in us. We all love ourselves so much. You love yourself. I can see that you love yourself by, because you, you all look beautiful here today, this morning. You all looked in the mirror. You all did your hair and had a shower to care of your body. And you ate and you never miss a meal. It's good. Self-love is so ordinary and it's so strong in us that Jesus used it as a reference to point, love your neighbor. So, because if you just say love your neighbor, you will never know how to do that. So Jesus says, okay, I know how to get the message through to them. Love like yourself. Do you love yourself? Love them like you love yourself because this we can understand. We can understand how we love, how important our body is, our, our belly is, our face is, our hair is, and take care of everything we like, the good food, the good restaurants, and everything. So Jesus says, I know people understand that. So I will teach them a deeper truth. As you love yourself, love your neighbor. Jesus says it somewhere else a bit differently. He says, do to others, Matthew 7, 12, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law of the prophet. He says it a little bit different. Do to others or treat others in the same way that you would like to be treated. Do to them what you like them to do to you. Love is invisible. You see, do you love God? Okay, how do I know you love God? How do you know that I love God? Because it is an in invisible, internal passion. You may have that for God. I'm passionate about God. I love Jesus. Oh, Jesus, I love you so much. But Jesus says, you want to mirror my love. This is what you need to do. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is a very, so, it's so basic. This is the essence of Christianity. This is the essence of being like God. You see, in Romans it says that God, those who cho we chose, he has called them to become like the image of his son. 
So then look at Jesus. He's the perfect example. When you look for example in the New Testament, you will find many examples of love and how God is, is, is gracious and merciful. And actually Jesus says, be, the way that he puts it to us, be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. That is repeated exactly the same thing that we read over here. First John says it like this. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love, which shows itself in, in actions. It says our actions will show that we belong to the truth. When, when we manifest that, it shows that our, our love with God is sincere. It's true. It's not only I love you and then you yeah, just go away. Uh, the next verse says, if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression. We can see love. We can understand love with, with actions. James. James says, that he calls it the royal law. One law rules over all other laws. The royal law is found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor in the same way as you love yourself. If you obey this law, you are doing it right. And if you look at all of these texts in the New Testament, you will find that there is a, a context in which uh, either James or John is using it. And the, the text that we read about John, this is a context about you have an opportunity to help somebody that is in need. Now, don't only say I love you with your words and just walk away without helping. It's a practice. Again, it goes back to basic. It goes back to practical love. I can help you. If I love you, I will do something. I will try to walk alongside with you. I will sympathize, empathize with you, and I will find a solution. I will try to do something for you. So that's in First John. And James, this is another context. And James, it is the rich man and the poor man comes to church. The, the poor man was sitting in the front. That was the last seat of the room. So the, the rich man comes in. So you come and you tell the, the, the poor man, would you mind sit in the back because Mr. Rich Man just walked in. So he says, and then he calls it the, the, the royal law. If you practice the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, okay? Would you like to be the poor man? To be uh, dishonored, put down, or compared like you, yeah, you have less value than another person? Would you like to be treated like that? No. So don't do it to ourselves. If you do it, this is the royal law. You are doing good. You are doing well. So everywhere you go in the New Testament and you will see this quote coming from Leviticus. You will see a practical uh, example how to do something. And one of the most wonderful ones is in Romans chapter 13. In Romans chapter 13, there's also a context here, diff different. Earlier in the chapter, Paul brings up a few social duties. Uh, submit to the authorities, pay your taxes. Very basic, submit to your authorities, pay your taxes. And then in verse 8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. And then the, this is the context. And then in verse 9, going onwards, he singles out certain commandments that forbid acts that would harm your neighbor. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't lust. It's kind of a parallel with Levi the, Le the text in Leviticus. It says, owe nothing to anyone Accept your obligation to love one another. If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirement of the law by not doing. Verse 9, can you click this one? Yes, thank you. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Don't do this. Why not doing that if you love? Because it will harm somebody. It will destroy a marriage. It will take the property of someone. It will put down someone else. It will uh, injure the life of someone. These are commandments against adultery and all these. Love does not exploit other people. Love does not take the possession of other people. This is sin that does that. S -s Selfishness does that. Greed does that. Loss does that. 
Love does not. Love is the cure that God says. So if you and I, the message, one of the messages of Leviticus is that if you want to be holy like God, understand what holiness is in a very practical way, don't do these things that would harm other people because of love. Verse 10, love never does anything that is harmful to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's, that's the message of Leviticus. That's the message of the New Testament. Instructions in Leviticus, they are grounded in the reality of who God is. God is holy. The instructions are proving that. It comes out of the character of God. And God, who has called us to be holy, is asking us to do one thing, love your neighbor as yourself. You know that Leviticus has uh, inspired many go government or NGOs or some, some groups in the world to, to do something with that. There's an organization that I was reading about. It's called uh, the Jubilee Movement. You know why? Because they, they read in Leviticus chapter 25 about uh, the Jubilee when the debts are uh, remitted forgiven and the slaves are set free and they started an uh, international movement pleading to the governments to surrender the debts to the poor nations of the world to the third world to call for the forgiveness of third world debt uh, and this movement it has been inspired by by this one if you remember also in the list that we had in uh, the, 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 the text of Leviticus it says do not mistreat the foreigners in your land. He says, treat them as the natives are. Love them as you love yourself. Yesterday I received a, a message that one brother from the African community, that very close friend with Brother Philip here, has passed away, uh, Saidi. Brother Saidi is from Congo. Brother Saidi uh, had a, for many months treatment for his kidney, dialysis. And he should have had a, 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 another kidney. He's, he's, he's about your age. Eh? He's about Philip's age. And he has been a, a lawyer. He has been a, a leader in the African community, the, the French uh, 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 Fellowship uh, and Divine Church. I have met him before. He's a faithful man. And uh, because he was an asylum seeker, he, his name could not be put on the list for a kidney. So he died, just because he was an asylum seeker. And in the list of the commandment that God gives, he says, treat them like a native. He's been here many years, 15 years, 18 years, 12 years. Yeah, he's been here many years. So it's not like he arrived only yesterday. He's been seeing lawyers, he's been to immigration, he's been doing this and that. And he, even though when he had his uh, dialysis, his treatment for many months and he was very weak, he still attended the, the fellowship. But then he, be, he came into a coma and then from the coma he died. Why? Because we did not obey this commandment of God. Love does not treat like that. Love does something. Love finds a solution because, oh, he's only a Islam seeker. We, d we don't give him the same treatment as somebody, something else. So these are uh, things that we, that we see. Holiness is something that is very, very misunderstood. But if you go back to basic, it's actually very, very practical. If you look at the epistles of the Apostle Paul, many of the uh, prison epistles, you will see that the first chapters are spiritual, talking about God, the promises of God, the work of Jesus Christ, in Christ, we have this, we have that, we have become our identity. Then you come to certain chapters and it's all practical. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, for instance, it says, uh, with humility, Keep the unity of the spirit and bearing one another for, the, for the, the, the faults of others, making allowance for them. Chapter 5 of Ephesians starts with imitating God, his love, uh, imitating the love of Jesus Christ. And as he has forgiven ourselves, we must forgive an, uh, others. And immediately after that, after talking about being an imitators of the love of Jesus Christ, it goes get don't practice sexual immorality. Uh, don't use a bad language. Uh, don't be uh, filled with lust and greed. Same message 
of Leviticus. Same Christianity. Chapter 6, it starts about the same thing. It talks about work, workers, the slave, you know, and everything, the wa working to do your best. Then it moves to family, husband, wife, children. Practical Christianity. That is what is preached in Lighthouse here. For years and years, the foundation of Christianity, yes, the Holy Spirit, the, the, the promises of God are yes and amen, the spirituality, but with the two feet on the ground, with the two feet on the ground and at home, with the children, with, with being generous. One of the things that we, we learn in Lighthouse is generosity. Someone was expressing the joy the feeling of satisfaction for being generous says every time I give, I feel good about it. I, I, I knew the feeling when I uh, answered God's call in my life to go to, to mission field and we have to let go of our home. We just had our home. Our family was young. We just had our first home. And then we felt that we had to let it go to to respond, to, to, to go in China and love Chinese people and bring Bibles into China and to serve, to serve in the church. We responded out of love. I remember preaching years ago in Canada. I was preaching on a, um, a book that John Bunyan, a great uh, uh, Christian theologian and uh, preacher that was in prison for most of his life, uh, had written about the vision of hell. And when I, w I read this book, which is an allegory, it's not the reality, but it's an allegory, it's describing the suffering of hell. I was so touched. When I was talking about it, I could not but just cry boo-hoo, boo-hoo on, on over all the, the things that I was reading because I was realizing that people who do not know Jesus Christ are not going to heaven. And it was so deep deep at that time, the message of that. So th the love of God to, to, to walk in holiness brings these, these things here. It says in, the first, uh, in Corinthians, the love of Christ constrains us to urge people to be reconciled to God. I was reading in a little story about uh, uh, an artist in Las Vegas who was an atheist. And for years he's done his show and everything and he was n not really uh, interested in Christianity and everything. So one night, he finished his show, was very successful, and someone came to him, a business person, and uh, that person came and complimented him and told him about how great the, the show has been, how he appreciate everything. And then before he left, he gave him a New Testament with a personal note inviting him to contact him if he need help, if he can help him and everything. And he was so touched because he says, in all of my years, it's the first time that I see someone giving me something about Christianity. He was an atheist, but no Christian had been to him yet in years and years and years and years. And for the first time, someone was interested in his, in his life. And you know his, what his reasoning is? He says, if heaven and hell are true, and we are withstanding that message to someone, are we walking truly in love? Loving your neighbor. Because if this is true, if this is the greatest reality awaiting us ahead of us, and we are never talking about it, we are never introducing anybody to Jesus Christ, are we really loving our neighbors? That is the reflection of that atheist when he received the Bible. So for us, New Testament Christian, we know what we have to live by. This is the holiness that God wants us to, to live by. Jesus says, if you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? The pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Leviticus is more than a list of old rules. It is a profound theological statement about living and loving God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord.